We also looked at the industry and we weren't the scrappy upstart anymore. Bigger competitors had wised up to what we were doing and were sort of coming for our lunch as well. We saw the market being a lot more competitive. Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. Hey, Nick, how are you? Very good. How are you? I'm doing all right. I have to say, Nick, I think you have a gift for naming companies. <laughs> I was looking through your LinkedIn. I'm like, Trumpet, that's a fun name. Like, what does that What does that mean? And then I was, I was going further down and it was Design My Night. And I'm like, what are you designing? Like, what is, <laughs> what, I'm going to show up and what's going to happen? <laughs> I, I love that part, like naming companies, coming up with it. Trumpet works very nicely, especially for what we do, especially because we didn't want like a boring SaaS name, which lots of companies are. So we can have a lot of fun with Trumpet. And I think you also had like an awesome reverse pitch because I sent you that email saying like, hey, the podcast. And you're like, also, B2B software, <laughs> Trumpet, you should check it out. And I'm like, oh man, that, Nick, this is awesome. This is really cool. So Nick, I'm, I'm happy to have you on the podcast. Essentially, this podcast is talking a little bit about what your exit is like and and where you are kind of with your, your post-exit life. But also, I'm, I'm interested in learning, if you were to give an introduction for yourself that doesn't include the companies that you founded or those companies, what would you give for your introduction? What would you say? I would say... Marketing guy at heart, brand focus. I love the startup community, loves helping and educating new founders, loves football or soccer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that makes sense. One of the things that stands out whenever I talk to post exit founders is that after they sell their company, there's a little bit of a transition as far as like who is their identity? What do they want to be when they quote unquote grow up? Right. And who the those other things right the the lover of like the startup environment and helping people grow their business the lover of football slash uh, soccer you know like those things are even more important after you sell a company just because of that transition period yeah definitely definitely I was so pegged to being the founder of x business that is your identity um because it's so all-consuming so when you don't have that yeah you're like who am i at my core i guess yeah, it's, uh, it, look, it's very rare, I guess, as adults that you have the luxury on the one hand of not needing to work, but then also not working, especially I think people like us that are just constantly on the go. So to then wake up that morning and have nothing to do, no emails or no responsibilities, it's quite uh, disarming, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I mean, your company got pretty big. It had a lot of people that were involved. Mind sharing a little bit around how big did the company end up getting? And what were you designing? So yeah, when we sold, we had about 100 people. We sold it for north of around $35 million. So the design my night, essentially like an open table, but for nightlife. So sort of bars in the UK pubs, rather than restaurants. And it started just as like a a discovery platform um, because yeah. in the UK, actually, we only really had time out. But then we sort of pivoted to SaaS. So then we built a reservation software, but just for bars and pubs and then left Open Table and Booker Table and Resi and all those to, to fight over restaurants. Everyone had left bars and pubs. And it's a very different booking need to book into a bar versus a restaurant. So we built a very flexible software that basically when bars saw it, they were like, yeah. So we sort of quickly you know, signed up the, the bar scene in the UK. Um, then we built a ticketing software to compete with like Eventbrite and Ticketmaster. Again, more in our space. So for like pop-ups, small festivals. Again, like flexibility, great customer service, you know, that Eventbrite and Ticketmaster, et cetera, didn't have. And then, yeah, we sort of ran those two in conjunction. They're like the B2C website, which got very big. And then the, the 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 SaaS component as well. And it was, yeah, our first startup as well. Whenever I think about going to see a bar, I don't think about having to reserve a, a stool for a cocktail or for a beer. Is that a thing that's unique to the UK or is that something where you found this gap in the market and you're like, I'm going to fill this gap? We sort of made that market happen. So the timing was right. So it was, we, it was sort of launching, especially in London, like the cocktail bar. They were run like restaurants. So, you know, you would book a table, you had the table for a few hours. They were very busy. They had wait lists, et cetera, um, but still needed flexibility that restaurant software didn't offer. So we started in that area. So, if you know, if you think of like the top 50 bars in New York, the top 50 bars in Chicago, you would need to book 
And then you had all like the more fun, casual bars. But we sort of went to the market and said, look, pre-booked revenue is very important, but you don't do it at the moment because you don't know how to manage it. And you haven't got a software that can help you manage it. And you see software as a problem. Let's give you a software that's going to make that easy for you. But then we said to the consumer, you're used to just showing up at a bar with your, your backpack on, trying to find a stool. But what if we told you you could book for your four friends, those four stalls or the booth or whatever? And then when you put the two together, it sort of carved out that market. Did you go bar to bar, essentially, and, and sell this? How did you get into the bars in the first place? Yeah, at the start, it was very much boots on the ground. Every weekend, we would go in there probably a few hours before they were opening. I knew you'd be able to get hold of the manager, but they weren't like mega busy and sounded them out about the industry you know what problems are you having from a discovery point of view you know where do you list how do you find new customers and the sites that you use currently what do you like what don't you like so it was very much boots on the ground selling them our vision and this was back in 210 so you know we were going in literally with like a one pager not like an ipad <laughs> like print it out <laughs> yeah literally <laughs> like this is what we're trying to build bar napkin <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly hospitality is very good for building relationships so yeah. you know if you're you're nice and you're trying to help their business very conducive to that it was very much every evening every weekend going in trying to meet the managers and in the early years just hear their pains and how we could help and then we sort of built especially the software off the back of all of that. You ended up selling this, right, to the Access Group in 2017. What was that process like? How did you come to the conclusion that was the right time to sell? We started it in like our mid-20s. So we sort of for, for, for when all of our fun 20s because we were just working like nonstop on this business. And I think we were just, A, I think we were exhausted. You know, we'd done really well. Andrew, my co-founder, and I had set a target of what we wanted from the business. We never wanted or needed this to become like a global unicorn. We had set our horizons on financial freedom. And we actually did the exercise of what financial freedom looks like for both of us. And luckily, we were quite aligned on that. So on the one hand, we were actually very methodical. And we were like, well, look, if we can get it to this, this number of revenue, we know that the multiples in hospitality SaaS are this, which means we could exit for maybe this, which means we would get this back in our pocket, which is the money we want. So a year out from hitting that ARR target, we sort of started speaking to the market. We actually did it very formally. So we engaged a broker who actually did like a seven month process from interest, signing the docs to then taking us on the journey of exiting the business and signing the docs with them. We also looked at the industry and we weren't like the scrappy upstart anymore. So, you know, the bigger competitors had wised up to what we were doing and were sort of coming for our lunch as well. So we, we, we saw the market being a lot more competitive. So we thought it needed a home, someone that had a lot more cash than us as well. You are probably the first person I've talked to that was as aware as they are as far as this is what I want from the business. This is the revenue I need to hit to get the multiple that I want to be able to have that exit. You're probably the only one I've talked to that, that has done that reverse math for their first company. Like usually after you exit the first time, you have enough awareness that you understand where you are and, and what that exit might look like. That's pretty unique. Is that something that you got advice on from like another entrepreneur or is that something that you you were just able to work backwards from? I think we were just both very transparent in, in what we wanted from the business. Like Andrew and I are quite unique in the founder world that we're like not romantic about it. We didn't just want to start a company because we wanted to do our own thing and change the world. Actually, we want to do it because we want to do our own thing and have some fun. But, and we didn't want to work for corporates anymore, which is where we did work. And we trusted ourselves that we were the right two people to build something. But then we were, yeah, very clear with each other on, on that we wanted financial freedom from this. We didn't want to run this forever. And in our heads, we were like, we're still young. If we exit when we want and we get the financial freedom, that then opens up the next part of our life where you haven't got the stress of finance, so which hopefully allows you to then be a bit more free to decide what you really want to do. I mean, getting that first exit early on is a superpower. Like it sets you up in a very unique way and it changes your perspective on any business that you start after that that first one. How was that earnout period? Because you stayed with the parent company for a while. 
Um, so what were you doing for them and, and how was that experience? So we had a two-year earnout. It was revenue targets as well. It was very strange because, yeah, we'd built this brilliant culture. It, this was pre-COVID, so we had like a really cool office in Shoreditch in London, which is like the cool tech scene area. And then the company that bought us are like a, a UK unicorn, like but like an unsexy one. So people hadn't heard of them, but like very well run company. The founder had set it up in the nineties, was still there, uh, you know, very, you know, but 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 a lot more old school than the way we do it. And they had a hospitality vertical, so we fitted very nicely into that. So we sort of just had to get our heads around the fact that we had to say yes to things from them, but also we were quite strong willed that we had targets to hit and we knew how to run this business and they didn't. So I think it was a, a balance of letting them win on some things to keep the corporate side of them happy. You know, they did own us now, but on the second part of it being very strong will that, well, look, we know how we need to grow this business over the next two years. So you're either going to help us or give us obstacles. If you want to help us, help us, but let us crack on. If you're going to give us obstacles, we're going to push back on them. So we got on fine with them, but it was a bit push and pull. And obviously, our team was quite young as well. So helping them understand what the next chapter looked like for them, you know, suddenly they were being part of a big company. So it was showing them the perks of working for a big company, while it was also Andrew and I's job to keep that startup spirit. And we kept our office. It was a, a very like push and pull sort of two years but we did hit the earn out in the end so everyone left happy hey podcast listeners this is nate from the made it podcast wanted to reach out to any uh, founders growth marketers sales leaders listening we've made a community just for you and we wanted to invite you to join we have growth playbooks for you to use instructional events a few dozen every month to learn how to use the latest technology uh, even some free services that can be helpful to help your company grow the first thousand people to join are free we've created a link you can click on it in the bio for this episode we hope to join us over at our community when i talk to post-exit founders a lot of them regret having an earn out in their contract and they're like avoid the earn out and for many cases i can see why that might be true because you can't control so many things and you especially can't control if you you don't own the company. So there's things that could happen on the macroeconomic level inside your industry or your niche or your vertical. And then inside the company, the dynamics as far as how they allocate resources. And so there's like three different dimensions that you have to kind of like account for in addition to running a successful company inside another company. You mentioned it was it was challenging and it was hard, but you're also one of the few people that were able to hit their earnout target. Do you have any pieces of advice as to should you avoid an earnout altogether? Or if you do have one, this is what I recommend. I mean, look, the dream is you don't have an earnout, but you know, right. I think if you put that stipulation in, you'll if if you have to accept a lower valuation. Our deal structure was X percent upfront, X percent on the earnout, which was negotiated as part of the deal. You know, I think if you're selling you know, for anything over, let's say, you know, 20 million bucks, I think you've got to expect that your purchaser is going to want some form of handover or reassurances about what they're buying and the team that they're buying, unless it's just buying you for parts or an acqui hire. So I think we, we would have loved like a year, but then, you know, as part of negotiation, we negotiated that it was revenue, not EBIT. So, you know, I think if you're doing an EBIT earn out, you might then get hamstrung by what they allow you to spend. It can cause friction, but revenue, we just sort of knew what we had to do, how we had to grow the business. And what it does is it really focuses your mind, not necessarily on the good of the long term of the business, but for us, it was how do we grow revenue? And if things were being brought to our table by the team that was either too long term or wouldn't help grow revenue, it was a no. Whereas if that was five years ago, we would look at it more strategically and say, okay, yeah, strategically, that makes sense. Let's work on that project. So we became very revenue focused, which is no bad thing. And looked at all the things we could do to quickly uptick revenue across the business. Another tip, which was from our lawyers, actually, we had good lawyers on the deal. They put a clause in the contract. I don't know the exact wording, but it was something like, if the parent company materially changes any part of the acquired company, the full earnout has to be paid. What this clause obviously allowed us to do is have that protection. So if the buying company came to us and were like, you can't hire these five people that you had forecasted, or I think we should change your business model to this, we could just throw that clause at them and say, well, 
we'll do this, but that's materially changing our business and you'll have to pay us the full air down. How would you define what's material and what's not material? Very subjective, right? Yeah, which was quite nice that we had that in because we could be quite subjective with it. So at times it got a bit heated because they were like, well, we want you to do this. And we're like, well, for us, that's a big material change in our business. Like, You're stopping me from having my second cup of coffee this morning. That's <laughs> yeah. going to impact my performance and this company's trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've run out of energy by two o'clock. I think, look, It's a relationship thing. So we were there for two years. We didn't want to have this hell relationship with them. So it's like like being in a relationship. So, you know, some things we didn't love, but were fine. And we were like, look, let's just do that for their sake. But then other things we were quite strong on, we were like, well, no, this is when we can use that clause and say, no, no, we are not doing this. There is a little bit of a balance. And you do want people to walk away happy with the transaction on both sides. Like you want them to feel like it, your reputation is also at stake, right? Other people aren't going to want to do business with you or sell you their company if you don't have a good relationship with some of the previous companies that you've acquired. Nick, there's a story that I heard that maybe you might get a kick out of. Um, there's an entrepreneur out of New York. Um, I'll, I'll keep him anonymous for now, but he sold his company to a publicly traded company. But his lawyer added a clause that said, like, you're going to acquire us for this price and we can't liquidate our shares because you're a publicly traded company and and there's this earn out period. But if your valuation goes down because part of the purchase price is in stock, then you have to increase the stock to match where the original price is. A year or two, like you have to match wherever the price is. And like, lo and behold, like the company's stock price tanks and then the a uh, founder that got acquired ends up being the majority share individual shareholder for this publicly traded company. Then the publicly traded company is like, we don't want to do this. So like it doesn't it doesn't work for us. And so now they're in a back and forth trying to navigate the the nuance behind that. But I just thought that was really, really interesting. That's and, crazy. And <laughs> it just shows you. And I think that's also a good illustration of you really don't know what's going to happen. So I think if you just go into an earn out with your eyes shut thinking, well, you know, we just need to crack on like we have been for the last two years and everything will work itself out. You have to have all your bases covered. So, you know, that's where having really good legal representation with a law firm that knows what they're doing in this space is yeah. so important. The agreement we signed on on Exit was like, you know, 150 pages long. And I definitely didn't read it all back to front once. Very much relying on your lawyers to, you know, highlight the stuff you're not sure about, highlight the stuff you should think about. And then obviously them giving their opinion on what they've seen in in other acquisitions as well. This is important, at least for our deal, is that we had a lot back and forth with their legal counsel and our legal counsel. And some of it was relevant, some of it wasn't. And we had them write out all the things that we called business terms or like key important terms. We had them put them all in the spreadsheet. These 27 terms we feel like are really important. And then from there, we could write the back and forth inside the spreadsheet versus doing the red lines back and forth in the contract where they get petty and they're like, <laughs> they're adding their thing back in without like any commentary around it. But I think that probably saved us like tens of thousands of dollars is just by using a spreadsheet for the business terms versus a red line. It does get crazy when you start marking up the contract. I- I'm also very sort of humble when I go into things. So, you know, we said to our lawyers, you need to talk to us like we have no clue what we're talking about. So, you know, you talk to me like I'm a child when it comes to explaining these clauses. And I'm not embarrassed by that because I need and to. And they're, they're like, we were already doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're like, um, oh. <laughs> yeah, we can't get any more simpler. They put it into chat GPT now. <laughs> Same with like accounting, like finance isn't my strong point. So, you know, when I speak to the accountant or finance in my companies, I'm just like, don't talk to me like I'm the founder, like talk to me like I'm a child because I want to understand it, but it's way beyond my comprehension currently. And I think that's very important to put your ego aside during an acquisition and you know really trust the experts to get on with it. Hey, podcast listeners, if you guys are interested in cold email outbound outreach that actually works or thought leadership and how to build a community around some of the things that you're working on, I highly recommend incendiumstrategies.com. They're not just sponsoring this podcast, but they're also helping us with a lot of the communities that we run on the back end. Uh, so if that's something that resonates with you guys and you're interested in learning more, check out incendiumstrategies.com. Thank you guys. And back to the pod. Nick, I wanted to ask you about 
two also fun names. So Proud Ventures and then also Horseplay Ventures. Can you tell me about those two? Horseplay. So that was, so Andrew, my co-founder from Design My Night. So when we exited, we wanted to get into angel investing. Like I think most exited founders think that's just a rite of passage. So you, you exit, so then you go into angel investing. And what we wanted to do, like I'm a very brand guy, as I immersed myself into their angel world in the UK, obviously London especially has got you know a great scene. I just discovered these brilliant, smart people <laughs> that you just wouldn't have heard about, you know, who were angel investors. So what Andrew and I wanted to do was, well, like, let's create like a brand around us as angel investors. So almost looks like a VC, but actually all it is, is it's just, it's not Nick and Andrew, random angel investors, it's Horseplay Ventures, almost like our own family office. Um, so all Horseplay Ventures is like our angel investing arm. And there's no you know, fund or anything like that. It's just our own personal cash. But instead of just deploying it as Nick and Andrew, you know, people come to us as Horseplay Ventures. And as part of that, we wanted to to, to put in education. So, you know, on our, we, we created a website and there's tools on there for founders, do lots of podcasts for founders and uh, uh, fireside talk. And it's much easier just to say Horseplay Ventures rather than like us as individuals. But yeah, it it worked really well, to be honest. So, you know, we got great deal flow. We've we've invested in 56 startups across the world now. Having a little break at the moment, actually, almost looking at that as our fun one. Let's see how that performs. Uh, We're probably about four or five years into that with some in our mind that are going to do really well, which is exciting. It's a fun concept, really like lighthearted and and fun. That's what startups is like. You are messing around, especially in the early years. Like you've got no idea what you you can put all the slide decks together. You want you can have your vision. (laughs) But let's be honest, like especially on your first one, you're sort of messing around until you sort of, you know, find traction. So we wanted to like evoke that, that we don't take ourselves too seriously, which we don't. Um, and if you're not having fun doing this, so there's no point doing it, go back and, and earn a good salary at a corporate job uh, if you're not enjoying it. So that was sort of the premise of horseplay. And then Proud Ventures is something more like personal to my heart. So as a gay guy, saw that there wasn't much representation of that in both the VC world and founders. Both are very straight, white male rich background industries which is changing uh, luckily especially sort of five years ago there really isn't representation the fact we still still talk about women as a minority in this world is nuts because they're like like technically they're like 51 52 (laughs) percent exactly um (laughs) so it's it's crazy but it's good to see that that changing so from the Proud Ventures, it's a sort of London collective we put together of LGBT plus VCs and angel investors. So, so yeah. ones that work at VCs. And actually, we uncovered there were quite, you know, a few that sort of weren't out at, in their VC world because, you know, they were concerned what people would think, which again is crazy in, in 2024. And the idea of that is just helping LGBT plus founders. So uh, we throw events, we'll look at pitch decks. We don't necessarily fund. We don't have a fund or anything like that. But, you know, people are angel investors and work at funds. So we obviously have our own network. So, you know, any great decks that we really like, we'll, we'll spread among our, our peer network. And it just what we say to those founders is like, come and be yourself. You know, like we've spoken, we, we did a report in the UK, actually, that a huge percentage at unfortunately, I haven't got the number to my head, was that if you're LGBT+, plus, you will sort of hide that part of you when you're pitching to, to investors because you think it would be seen as a negative. What we say to these founders is like, whoever you are, however you want to represent yourselves, that's great with us. So just come and be natural with us. That's your, that's your gift in our world. Do you feel like it's for there to be more LGBT VCs as well as founders? Like, is it both sides of like trying to encourage them to like come to the table and co-invest? together as a group or as a cohort, as well as helping enable these founders that are trying to find venture capital? Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's just raising the conversation in VC land, because I said a lot of people in Proud Ventures work at VC. So I think it's educating VCs that, you know, there's a lot of education about sort of ethnic minorities. Um, and as I said, uh, women, not, um, 
but they're LGBT plus and it's not a competition between minorities, <laughs> but you know, that side of it, because I guess it's a, it's in, in some instances it's hidden. It's not as obvious, you know, as if you're ethnically diverse or a woman. So it's, it's often just goes untalked about because it's not seen as an issue, but you know, it's such a small percentage of LGBT plus founders are backed or a small percentage of LGBT plus founders that are happy to say that they are. It's saying to VC world, you need more representation of this community in your team as well. Because, you know, if you do have a guy that wants to wear makeup on a pitch, you know, he wants to feel comfortable with someone that understands him in that pitch. He might be the best founder you've ever met, but you will be judging him whether you say you won't or you are. So it's about having other representation within your VC because that will allow you to find more diverse founders. What we're talking about a lot is almost like syndicates, right? Like you're building a syndicate to invest in in a company or a portfolio of companies. And you're building like essentially a, a community or a, around a cohort of different companies, which I think is pretty exciting. Like you don't need to have a formal structure to be able to invest in these different companies. You can almost say this is like our ethos or our values and we're going to raise a fund around this. And you can find like-minded people to then invest in like-minded companies. And I think that's pretty cool. A lot of the things I start with tend to be in the mold of wanting to help people and not trying to start a business as such. So, you know, Horseplay is around angel investing, but we also want to educate. Proud, as I said, we haven't actually got a fund or even a formal syndicate at this stage. It's still just a network to help those founders and then we will just pass decks on to our networks and not take a cut or a fee or any of that. So it's, it's purely to help. It might become a world where we do have a formal syndicate or, or a fund or whatever. Where can you just help and make a difference? You know, I'm not a founder that's going to change the world, but I can help in little communities where, you know, I have a sphere of influence. So tell me about Pitch Deck Pod. What's the premise? That's uh, my my podcast, which actually started in lockdown, as I'm sure lots of people did with their podcast. The first premise of, of Pitch Deck was actually having loved uh, Shark Tank. Uh, we It's Dragon's Den in the UK, but watching it purely as entertainment. But seeing very quickly the founders I spoke to who weren't very well networked watched Dragon's Den or Shark Tank thinking that's reality. And, you know, thinking you're going to raise $50,000 and give up 50% of your business. You get on national TV and obviously in Shark Tank, it's a bigger viewership. But, you know, that is not, it's entertainment and it's great entertainment. I just wanted to do something a bit more realistic. The first premise was have a, a pre-seed, so an early stage founder pitch for five minutes to myself every episode. And then I'd bring in an angel investor or an early stage VC next to me. Uh, They would pitch for five minutes, uh, we cut them off after five minutes, and then we would basically have a live Q&A as if you were speaking to an angel investor on that 30-minute call. So we would just ask all the questions we would ask if that was a normal angel investor 30-minute call. They either answered very well or they didn't answer very well. And then the last five minutes, just myself and the investor had a chat, like what we liked, what we didn't like, how they could have improved. And the premise was just to sort of open the lid for founders on what that first 30 minute meeting with an angel or an early stage VC might look like. What are the types of questions they ask? What are they interested in? It was often very interesting when I had a VC with with me, you know, the questions they would ask versus me as an angel. You know, we've obviously got very different needs and requirements. So we did that for three series, uh, did really well. Then I've started my new business. So the time it takes to put that show together, I was doing it all myself, was was long because you obviously have to find founders that have an interesting business that are confident to, to pitch and have a live Q&A. And then on the other side, investors that are confident uh, enough to do a live Q&A. Pivoted it slightly at the moment to just be 25 minute conversations with early stage investors. And that can be an athlete, that can be an angel, that can be an early stage VC. I don't care who you are, but if you invest in early stage um, and just what do they look for? What do they like? And sort of build up a, a bank where founders can listen to from all different types of early stage investors on sort of what people look for at at that time. And it's bite-sized, so it's like on purpose, I do it for 25 minutes. Hopefully they learn something within those 25 minutes. It takes a decent amount of time to raise that capital or to hone in that pitch that could be used on like, well, you you could have been on the market, you know? How do you feel about like uh, the difference between like a VC company that 
uh, needs that capital to grow versus a bootstrapped company that can maybe get to their first 5 million solo. I'm a big advocate of bootstrapping and Design My Night was that. So we only ever raised half a million pounds throughout our whole life cycle. So, you know, you could say that was bootstrap. My new business, Trumpet, is VC back pre pre product pre revenue so two very different journeys so i'm seeing both sides even like a company that i think could be suitable for vc i always will advise the founders to to not dive straight into it get that get get some semblance of traction or a market need for your product and i'm just a huge advocate of the, of the angel community you know to go out and raise $100,000 $200,000 to get that traction to get that product to market will just set you up so much better when you're talking to VCs. A lot of VCs are say they pre- they're pre-seed, but actually very, very few are genuinely pre-seed, pre-product, pre-revenue, really understand what pre-pre-seed is. So if you can go to VC with some form of traction and, you know, you raise that angel round, you can do it at a quick and dirty, I call it. So, you know, give them a good valuation, but you're only raising a small amount. So you're not giving up much equity. And then when it comes to your VC round, your pre-seeds, you can get a much better valuation than you would ordinarily. But the other side of it, I say to founders is, you know, what is it? 0.009% of companies are suitable for VC. Like you don't have to become a unicorn for you to be a success. So like we said at the top of the show, when Andrew and I were looking at Design My Night and our exit, our financial freedom was nowhere near having to have an have a unicorn. You really need to decide that what do we want from this business? Like, do we want a lifestyle business where I can take five hundred thousand dollars a year from it and live a really comfortable life doing something that I really enjoy? Do I want to exit for ten million dollars but own ninety percent of the equity and have life changing sums of money, or do I want to go and build a unicorn and you know? Uh, eventually exit with hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I think we're just bred in the startup world, you know, very like tech crunch that you celebrate fundraises and you celebrate <laughs> unicorns, but you don't really celebrate like a design my night exit, you know, got no press anywhere, but we changed an industry in the UK. Us as founders had a total life changing exit. Um, we were able to give money to all of our staff, some for life changing money as well, and has now enabled us to go on to this, uh, you know, the next phase in life. So for me, that's a huge success. Whenever I invest in a company as well as an angel, that's the first conversation I have with them. I'm like, look, you've got my money now. You, you can cut the crap. What do you want from this? Do you want a 20 million exit? Because I'll be happy with that because I've come in at two. So that's still a good return for me. And if you want 20 million, let's work together on how we're going to get you that 20 million. Or do you want to go and be 100 million billion? Okay, well, that's a very different path. Let's look at that. Out of the companies that you've invested in, what are some of the ones that you think stand out at the moment or or some of the ideas that you think might be exciting to talk about? There's a company in the UK called Honest Mobile. So that is a a phone contract. They basically, what they tried to do is sort of bring Revolut ideas to phone companies. So it's, it's, you know, who likes their phone company? You're, you're on the phone to them for hours. They're putting your bills up. There's roaming charges now. They don't give you anything. And you think about that with the banking industry. And then, you know, Monzo, Starling, Revolut came along. It's all app-based. There's perks. You can contact customer service in 20 seconds on chat. So they really brought that to the mobile phone industry where it's all app-based. You get a reply in 20 seconds. There's AI in there. They actually bring your bills down the longer you stay with them. They don't put them up. And they're being very forward thinking. So, you know, they, you know, one of the first with eSIMs and, you know, for example, they're looking at, okay, we can't give you free roaming in this country, but we will pay for you to use Google Maps and Uber because it doesn't cost us really hardly anything but we'll give you free roaming on Google Maps and Uber because that's what you use when you're abroad. This company sounds fantastic. Are they in the United States or no? No, it's still UK. Doing really well. And and it's called Honest Mobile because they also, uh, so it's carbon negative as well. How big are they? They've got like tens of thousands of customers in the UK. Um, Okay. Still still a long way to go because obviously it's a big industry to go after. Lots of competitors in the UK. I really like that one. There's another one called Fanbase, which... I they don't describe I describe it as sort of like the iOS for sports teams. So they're not looking at tier one sports teams. So they're not looking at like NFL or Premier League soccer. 
all the teams lower and university, basically they allow you to sell tickets. They allow you to manage your uh, memberships, your corporate stuff, booking your rooms in there, CRM for your fan data, because all the lower league teams just don't do any of this. It also has a white label app. So a sports team can have their own branded app for their fans where they can all engage, buy tickets, etc. Yeah, they're doing really, really well. And actually have just, just gone to the US and are speaking to college teams. Because obviously the college institutions you guys got uh, are unbelievable. Like the amount, the stadiums you've got and uh, the tickets you sell for, for college. Is... Even our high schools have like $55 million stadiums. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 I was literally on an investor update call with them the other day. And, and one of the founders just moved over to the US. And he said, in our pipeline, you'll never believe it. We've got high school now that will probably be doing as much revenue as a second tier soccer team in the UK. Our teacher pay, not so great, but our stadiums are fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, that blew my mind. So I think they've they've really found something. Uh, and obviously, the, the market is huge, not just in the US, which we're discovering, but and it's not just soccer over here. So, you know, basketball, rugby, hockey. You're tapping into like these sub communities that are, are there, like they exist and they're passionate, right? But they yes. maybe are not as coordinated. So exactly. I think this being very much in your alley, right? Because you like yeah. sports, but also... Um, you're kind of building this community that's already there, but you're you're helping build it up, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's like a you know helping them bec- helping them act like a Premier League soccer team, but without having to pay you know millions of, of of pounds for that. And I love those types of businesses, like finding these niches that the community is there, but for whatever reason are underserved. Um, so yeah, they're doing a great job as well. I really appreciate you joining Nick uh, for the podcast. That's that's the pod where should people go to find you nick best place to, to sort of connect with me is on linkedin um that's sort of the only social media i actually use in my life so um and i, and I talk business on there uh give give lots of education i hope on my current startup journey at trumpet but also what i've learned in the past and my angel investing as well so yeah i try and give a lot of education on there so definitely connect with me that's awesome nick thanks for being on the pod That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.